Okay, can you share your screen so they can make sure you can share your screen? Okay, that looks good. Thank you. Oh, I was muted, sorry. <laughs> uh, so the slides are changing, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. How much time do I have? Uh, you have two hours. Or maybe 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 can talk a little bit longer. Yeah, I can stay. Yeah, I mean we shouldn't talk longer than two hours, but uh, so I will not rush through the presentation. I will just you know, because usually I prepare like forty slides for fifteen minutes and then just rush through them for the fifteen minutes. So now I will be just more relaxed and you know. The moderator just joined. Hello, hi, hello. Yeah, hi, bye, 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 bye. Hi, bye, bye. hi Zaki. <laughs> All right. Uh, Zaki, have you tried sharing your screen? Screen? Yep, it works. Okay, great, fantastic. Uh, so, uh, would you like to have this meeting uh, interactive, uh, so that the participants can ask? The questions during your talk or we can sure, leave the questions sure. for I, I think we have time for that. So Alan told me that we have two hours. So yes. I think we can be interactive, you know. Uh, All right. So we don't have to you know, rush through and then uh, have the have this, this questions in the end. Okay, good. So how, how do you think how long will be the talk? Uh, depending on how interactive it will be, I think it will take something like 40 minutes at most. All right. So, okay. Sounds good. All right. I can see that we already stream our Zoom on YouTube, which is great. Thanks, Helen. Welcome. So let's wait for a few minutes and then we'll start. So we have 15 participants, more people are coming. Uh, how many were registered? Uh, for Hello. event, right? We have 150 something. Mm. Okay, so the usual experience tells that one fourth of the number will join. So we will have something like 40 people, 35 to 40 people. Yes. Some people will join on YouTube only, I guess. Usually uh, 20 people on YouTube. Yes, okay. Pavel, have you seen the Oppenheimer movie? Yes, yes. Ah, did uh, you like it? <laughs> yeah, it was very good, I think. So uh, I actually I watched it on, on Wednesday, so only three days ago. Yeah, I, I enjoyed so nice, nice movie and uh, nice story, of course. Did you did you watch it as well? Yeah, yesterday. So yesterday, I, okay. Yeah, it was nice. You know, I usually don't watch three hour long movies without any break, yeah. but you know, this 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 one was mm -hmm. good enough to you know just endure the entire way. Mm -hmm. I'm curious uh, what what's the portion that was uh, the real story and which part is just a fiction. But Andy. <laughs> All right. I have some questions or comments. All right, no spoiler, please. Yeah, no spoilers. <laughs> okay. The only spoiler is that. We think it's a good movie, so. <laughs> okay, yes, we can, we can recommend it. All right, it's very hot in Washington. So Helen, what's the, what's the weather? It's really hot. Yes. 
Uh, How is it in Poland? In in Germany, for the last week, it has been quite rainy and a little bit coldish. Not cold, but you know. Uh, it's about like 20, twenty. Yes, twenty. About twenty-five yeah. degrees in Poland. So the previous weekend was very hot, uh, but now it's it's better and uh, it's also rainy. So we have rain almost every day now, and it will be the same until. Tuesday or Wednesday at least. So probably it's similar to, to Germany. Yeah, yeah. I mean, two weeks ago here it was like near 40 degrees and then now it's like 20, 25. So it, it's okay. pleasant now, but let, let's see what happens in August. Okay, nice. Uh, all right, it's two minutes past. 1 p.m. in Washington, I believe. So, Helen, do you think we should start? I don't see more people coming now. Uh, Bangkok rains heavily. Okay, so I think we can start. Uh, the meeting is now recorded. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Welcome to the next uh, meetup organized jointly by quantum computing groups from uh, Washington, D.C., Toronto, and Warsaw. My name is Pavel and I will be the moderator uh, of this uh, meetup and we have a pleasure to host uh, a great speaker, Zeki Seskir. And Zeki will tell about democratization of quantum technologies. Uh, before we start, we would like to announce that, of course, this meeting is, is recorded. So hopefully the video will be later available on uh, the YouTube channel of uh, OrionX. And uh, we already agreed with Zeki that uh, uh, we will try to make this uh, lecture interactive so that if you have any questions, um, please raise your hand or post your question on chat. And uh, if there are some urgent questions related to, to the slides, we'll try to interrupt and, and ask. If there are more general questions, uh, I recommend to just keep them for the end. There will be also a Q&A session at the end. Uh, and um, yeah, we would also like to announce the next uh, meetup. So next uh, weekend, but uh, this time on uh, Sunday, uh, it's correct. Um, uh, Dr. Q Yong Wong will tell about uh, simulation augmented machine learning for semiconductor physics and uh, defect uh, discovery. Uh, later in August, um, Henry Liu. A PhD candidate from Chicago will tell about challenging quantum advantage with uh, classical simulation. Then in September, uh, Daniel Claudino will give a talk about quantum simulation based on expansions of Hamiltonian moments. Uh, then in October, uh, Professor Vlad Kovedral uh, will give a talk about some open problems in fundamental physics. So before we start, we would also like to thank our partners and, uh, and sponsors. Um, so there are several partners, as you can see. And uh, recently, we also celebrated the anniversary, sixth anniversary of the Washington DC quantum computing meetup. So we thank you for being with us and hope you will attend uh, our future events as well. Uh, and if with this, I will stop sharing my slides. Uh, and Zeki, if you are ready, the Zoom is yours and we can start. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. And I hope that you can see the slides and slides are changing. Yes, I can see the slides at least. Mm -hmm. OK, perfect. So I will, I will take it over from here. So I will be checking the chat from time to time. And for example, I see that Helen wrote, uh, you can get the slides after the event. Uh, yeah, so feel free to ask for them uh, through, through her. Okay, uh, well, first things first, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's great to be here again. I think I was here last year uh, or, or beginning of this year. Uh, so I really love this series of uh, meetups. And uh, my name is Zeki. I'm currently a PhD candidate at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, Institute for Technology Assessment and Systems Analysis. And my topic is, well, it's primarily quantum technologies, but uh, more, more focused on technology assessment for quantum technologies. 
and today I will uh, talk about our joint work with uh, Steven Ombrello and Peter Famas uh, from TU Delft and Christopher Kernan is my group leader here at ITAS. Um, I mean, and this is the... Uh, oh yeah, so I realized why I put this. So I'm also a part of uh, QWorld, uh, one, uh, one member of the Q Cousins uh, department under QWorld. I'm, uh, I was also a co-founder and co-coordinator for Q Turkey uh, until the end of 2022. Right now I'm kind of an, just an advisor. Um, and also I am one of the founders of Q Germany. So if you have any connections with Turkey, Germany, or you're interested in Q world, or you know, just uh, curious about what either of these things are, just feel free to connect to me uh, on LinkedIn and ask your questions. Uh, so the outline of today's talk uh, will be a very brief introduction to quantum technologies just for completeness sake because I assume if you're here you already know what quantum technologies are but just to be sure that we are talking about the same thing when we say quantum technologies I will briefly talk about it then give you some uh, again a brief background information on on the paper itself and the work uh, then I will continue with, uh, you know, why we are talking about democratization uh, in quantum technologies and what is there to talk about. And uh, in that uh, in that context, I will talk about different theories of democracy and in different value contexts. Um, then I will just digress a little bit uh, with a call for responsible quantum technologies and what does it even mean for responsibility or ethics. Uh, for, for a field like quantum technologies. Uh, then I will return back to our paper with the three narratives that we identified, which are kind of hampering democratization efforts and then offer some counter narratives. Then there will be a discussion, uh, hopefully, uh, and uh, some conclusions that we, we, uh, you know, we found out uh, while writing the paper. And then there will be some uh, shameless advertisements. And uh, if you are interested in, in the paper or, uh, you know, any, if you have any questions after the event regarding the paper, uh, you can either send an email to me uh, or Steven Umbrello at TU Delft, uh, or you can just uh, write to either of us through LinkedIn. And as I said, this is a collaboration between Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and uh, TU Delft. So with that, I'm starting and there is some uh, yeah, so the background noise is is the church uh, that is close by. Hopefully, it will <laughs> it will stop at some point. Uh, yeah. So quantum technologies. What do we mean when we say you know quantum technologies? And I'm sure almost all of you are familiar with this this framework. Uh, there is quantum communication, quantum computation, quantum simulation, quantum sensing and meteorology. These are the four main pillars uh, of quantum technologies. And they are built upon uh, the basic science, which is sometimes referred to as quantum information science or just quantum science. And uh, this is, of course, the European framework. In the US framework, quantum computation and quantum simulation are combined together. So there are three main pillars. But primarily both, uh, you know, continents are talking about the same things when we say quantum technologies. Uh, and there are, of course, uh, you know, horizontal fields like engineering control, software theory, and education and training, uh, which all of these, uh, you know, vertical pillars uh, require and, you know, benefit from. So it is kind of a complex web of uh, different technologies, different, you know, different uh, horizontal layers, and uh, all of them are built upon uh, the basic science. And why are we talking about quantum technologies? What is relevant? Uh, and one of the reasons we are is both the number of publications and the number of patents have been increasing quite rapidly since the last uh, two decades. And you know, this by itself doesn't necessarily mean much because you can find a lot of different fields uh, that these topics have been, uh, you know, different topics have been gaining uh, attention, especially in the last couple of years. Uh, one example is AI. Uh, but uh, one thing that is kind of uh, 
important uh, about quantum technologies is that it uh, the rate has been increasing in the last you know five to six almost almost the last decade. So it's like uh, it has been taking off. So it is not just a linear growth. Uh, and we can also see this in the number of startups here. You, so these are a uh, number of new startups per per year. And here you can see that uh, I mean. In 2012, there's uh, around eight startups being founded, but in 2018, it's like 76 uh, startups. So the number of new startups being founded has been also increasing quite rapidly, which means that if you know some uh, you know basic math, that uh, if the number of new startups are increasing like this, then the number of total startups are almost exponential. Uh, and in the last couple of years, there have been a kind of a decline in the number of new startups being funded. But uh, there's, you know, there's the pandemic. There's this. Uh, there are other issues that are related to, uh, you know, global uh, investment landscape. And also, if you read the paper, you will uh, see that we ended our data collection in very early 2022. So you know, these last two data points are a little bit uh, incomplete. Uh, and when we look at the geographical distribution of uh, how quant these quantum startups have been uh, you know, founded is, uh, it is not very clear that a, like a certain region of the world has, uh, has a really considerable upper uh, hand. We can see that the number of startups in the US and uh, EU are almost the same, but also you know, Australia, Canada and UK has um, almost as many startups as uh, US and EU. And the rest of the world is coming from a little bit behind, but it's still uh, considerable uh, in terms of the number. Of course, this doesn't mean that the numbers are directly comparable because there are certain startups with hundreds of millions of uh, euros in investment, and there are certain startups that just a couple of uh, people started for, for their uh, projects. But if we look at the uh, public investments into the field, uh, especially since um, since early 2010s, we can see that uh, there have been uh, many announced programs. Uh, a lot of the programs uh, have been uh, extended if, if they were announced more than five years ago. For example, the most recent one was UK. Uh, but also in Germany, uh, US, all that reauthorization, re uh, which practically means that even if a lot of things fail, we will still be talking about these technologies for the next five years because there are these dedicated uh, national and regional uh, programs with considerable budgets. And also one of the things that I would like to show you is that the, the diversity, you know, there are many, many, many different countries uh, that are investing into these technologies. Of course, certain regions of the world are kind of omitted, but that is usual. And we also expect uh, that uh, there will be uh, national programs from uh, you know, these kind of gray uh, countries. And of course, uh, we have been seeing an increased uh, media attention towards quantum technologies. Uh, that this goes back almost uh, a decade, like uh, the, the infinity machine, like the quantum computers were uh, you know, duped as the infinity machine back in 2014, and they make the cover of time. Uh, the, the Chinese quantum uh, communication satellite, MISUS or MOSI, also made the cover of science and uh, the quantum supremacy experiment, and of course, the uh, recent quantum leap uh, article in time. And of course, last year uh, the field was uh, vindicated, you know, validated with with the uh, Nobel Prize in Physics uh, given to Alain Aspe, uh, John Clauser, and Anton Zeilinger uh, for uh, for their experiments with entangled photons, establishing the violation of Bell inequalities, and pioneering quantum information science. And when we consider all of this. It's not a surprise that uh, the European Commission thinks that the future is quantum and it is supporting this, uh, you know, couple of billions of euros of a project called the quantum flagship. Uh, and so when we are considering all these, you know, excitement, media attention, uh, investments, number of startups, number of patents, publications, 
one question that comes to mind is um, will these technologies be democratized or will they be just for a selected uh, you know few or for the elites and uh, here you can see my cat is also uh, trying to get into the, uh, the, the conversation but uh, you know just just ignore her uh, and uh, Valve basically uh, thought that it would be interesting to look at the, uh, the narratives used by the companies, uh, by the researchers, uh, by the public organizations, and also try to make a, you know take a more uh, critical uh, approach. Not critical in the sense that you know we want to criticize this thing, but we wanted to you know conceptually explore what people actually mean when they say democratization and are all of them meaning the same things and what does even democratization mean in other contexts. Uh, the paper is open access, uh, you are free, you, you can freely uh, access to it. It was published in the Journal of Quantum Science and Technology uh, in uh, early this year. So what we did. Uh, there are, of course, uh, many different theories of democracy, uh, but we focused on, you know, just because we, what we needed to uh, give a cutoff at some point, we focused on uh, the three main ones, uh, the deliberative democracy, participatory democracy, and representative democracy. And then uh, we uh, tried to, uh, you know, take a stance in trying to identify the value context of these things. You know, democracy is an instrumental or intrinsic value. And I will, I will come to what I mean by these things. Um, but just keep in mind that you know, these are not related to the theories of democracy, but these are uh, certain value contexts that, uh, that works for all of the, all of the uh, theories. And uh, we identified uh, three main narratives that are at least we believe uh, or we observe that kind of hampers the, the democratization efforts in the field. Uh, and uh, we propose three counter narratives. Of course, these three narratives are not uh, exhaustive. There are many different narratives out there. Uh, and of course, our analysis of them are not uh, the only one. You can, of, you can read the paper and you can develop your own analysis of these narratives. Uh, and Again, of course, the counter narratives that we propose are just one of the many arbitrarily possible counter narratives that can be proposed. So do not, uh, I would recommend uh, not reading this paper as, you know, in, in the absolute, but just as a mental exercise and kind of a conceptual exploration of, you know, how can we investigate uh, with this term, you know, democratization, uh, are we meaning the same thing and uh, how is it related to the developments uh, in the field? And the three narratives that we identified are quantum technologies as an arena for geopolitics, quantum mechanics as incomprehensible, and quantum computing as a threat. Uh, so uh, you can find this in the paper as well, but uh, what we mean by when we say uh, we looked at the different theories of democracy, uh, we try to, you know, operationalize these concepts like, you know, of course, when we say representative democracy, participatory democracy, deliberative democracy, we all have some understanding of it, sorry, of, of them, uh, but we also wanted to kind of operationalize what we mean in practical terms, like what does it mean for number of participants? What does it mean for type of participation or what does it mean for participant selection methods? So one thing to note here is that when we say uh, democracy or democratization, we don't necessarily mean it as the political regime, you know, it's like democracy versus autocracy versus, you know, something. Uh, what we mean is a more uh, general concept uh, of democracy, you know, sharing of power and decision making. Uh, and you can have a democratic uh, elections not just for necessarily for a country, but uh, for an NGO, for, for a board of uh, a company, uh, for a student club. So when we say democratization, do not necessarily think that we mean just a political concept of you know having a parliament or something. 
uh, but of course we can uh, we can draw conclusions from how uh, these democratic models uh, operate in the, in the political context. Um, and for example, when we say deliberative democracy, what we mean is the number of participants should be relatively small, but kind of representatives, uh, representative of groups of people per activity, uh, as it is difficult to have deep deliberation with a large number of people. So again, uh, you know, there's, even though we are saying, uh, you know, we are talking about democratization in a deliberative context, uh, it is not necessarily like everybody should be there, but as much as uh, most of the people or most of the stakeholders should be represented. Uh, and the type of participation is, of course, with the name, it is deliberation, uh, and it requires that the participants are well informed about the topic and consider different perspectives in order to arrive at a public judgment and not an opinion. So this doesn't mean that in a deliberative democratic context, everybody should have the same opinion, but the idea is to come to a public judgment that these different opinions can agree upon. Uh, and the participant selection method, it can be an ideal, it can be a civic lottery or random selection, uh, or just, you know, inviting people from different organizations and looking at, you know, who they set. Uh, and participatory democracy, it is kind of the other way around. Uh, you can have large numbers of people, ideally everyone affected by a decision. Uh, it requires, uh, again, much more participation than the deliberative approach in all aspects of, you know, politics and decision making, especially even if you are talking about like, like an NGO or a company. Uh, and it encourages a diverse of uh, opportunities for engagement. So again, if we say political engagement, but you can consider this engagement in decision making in general. Uh, and it is self-selected participation, so it should be open. It should be open to anyone and everyone that wants to join and be part of the decision-making process. And finally, the, uh, the concept of representative democracy. You know, again, large number of large numbers of people, ideal everyone uh, affected, and the aim is to achieve majority of representation. And again, uh, representation uh, means that. Uh, you need people that are representing different stakeholder groups uh, and uh, what they are actually representing is not those individual people but their voice for their values for their concerns for their you know excitement so it's like representation of their uh, relationship with the, with the topic uh, and the selected uh, you know the, the participant selection method is the selected candidate participation uh, so, and so the, the representatives should be selected by the groups that they are representing. And uh, what we mean with different value contexts, uh, for example, uh, so the idea is that you might be involved in a, any of these democratization efforts, like in different uh, in different con theory contexts, like you might be starting from the deliberative democracy and you know, pursuing a democratization effort in that manner, but you might be doing this for very different reasons. If you are uh, using democracy as an instrumental value, which it has a lot of instrumental value because it is a decision-making model in, in space, you might be including stakeholders to support technology development and or ad adoption. Or you might be informing the stakeholders to reduce hesitancy towards the technology due to certain uncertainty, so basically social acceptance. But you might also be doing this because you believe that democracy is an intrinsic value in itself. You might be including stakeholders for the betterment of the deliberation process, or you might be informing the stakeholders to empower them for them to better present and defend their positions for deliberation. Uh, so in the paper, especially and you know personally as well, we do not think that there is a hierarchy between these two. So it's not like oh, intrinsic value is a, is better or more virtuous than instrumental value, but uh, we just want to highlight that these two are different value contexts. So if you are a company, if you are a for-profit company, then it would make sense for you to use democratization or democracy efforts. For, for their instrumental uh, value, so for, for instrumental purposes. Like it makes sense for 
I don't know whether we can name names, but uh, when uh, someone from Microsoft says that we are involving stakeholders to develop uh, technical solutions to the problems that we have, that's not necessarily democracy for dem democratization for democracy's sake, but it is still a democratic effort. So uh, when we are, uh, you know, looking at companies, NGOs, countries, and their efforts. Uh, this this value context uh, analysis kind of gives us a way to distinguish why they are involved in this because it is kind of na naive to think that all companies are just they love democracy and they want to be you know the champions of democratization efforts which they might be shouldn't jump to conclusions but it is not necessary for them to do that it is the the democratization efforts even in different democracy theories have a high instrumental value as well. Uh, and again, you can read this uh, in, the, in the paper. So let's uh, continue with, with the narratives. The first narrative, as you remember, was the was quantum technologies as an arena for geopolitics. And you can see this in, in uh, news articles or opinion pieces like uh, this one, the US and China are in a quantum arms race that will transform warfare. US and China and Europe are ramping up a quantum computing arms race, the rising specter of a quantum computing arms race. So you can see this narrative of an arms race going on. And why? Well, there's certain truth in it. Uh, you know, uh, different quantum technologies like uh, quantum sensing via quantum radars can have uh, or possibly expected to have a considerable uh, impact on how uh, the, the stealth uh, weaponries and stealth uh, flight works or gives an advantage towards its users. Um, and when you look at this <laughs> rather uh, interesting, let's say, uh, you know, warfare analysis, you can see that you can just stick uh, the word quantum in front of almost everything. Uh, so if it's communication, now it becomes quantum communication. If it's computing applications, it becomes quantum computing applications. If it is navigation, it becomes quantum navigation. So basically, quantum technologies have almost uh, a potential impact on all of the technologies that uh, that uh, the, the war making uh, efforts are interested in. And the second one is quantum mechanics as incomprehensible. Uh, if, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, obviously you don't understand quantum mechanics. And if you don't believe me, you should believe the great uh, Richard Feynman. And if you want to use this quote, you can find it in uh, more than 22 million uh, different forms with very different backgrounds in colors, different fonts, you know, different variations. So this is one of the most uh, widely used uh, scientific codes. Uh, and of course, when you, when you think about it, it is uh, actually a terrible code to use, especially for education and outreach efforts. Because when you are starting an education and outreach effort, you are practically signaling that we will talk to you about something, but you will not understand it. And if you think that you understand it, you are a stupid person because you can't understand it. So why? Well, there are some reasons for that. You know, if like Bohr is also correct, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly sh shook, uh, shocked you, you uh, haven't understood it yet. Uh, there is also this approach of shut up and calculate, you know, we don't care what it means as long as it works. Uh, you know, Mermin was one of the uh, one of the proponents of this, you know, there's no quantum measurement problem, according to him, because it works. And also, uh, we have, uh, you know, things like Penrose and Hammeroff, uh, you know, conjecture that there is there are quantum effects that uh, give rise to this. Uh, give rise uh, to, to the consciousness. And finally, uh, quantum computing uh, as a threat. Uh, I mean, this is, I think all of us know it, but if you just look at, uh, look at the media, you can see many uh, titles like this, like organizations need to be ready for this threat, 
for example, for some reason, it is sometimes referred to as the Chinese threads, but in fact, also, let's say US or uh, EU develops the device, they will also use it for breaking codes. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is sometimes even uh, referred to as an existential threat to the, to the entire infrastructure of the internet. Uh, and again, why? You know, when we look at, uh, you know, whether it will be an actual, uh, actual uh, threat, uh, we know that it will be. You know, that's one of the reasons why all of us are here, because in 1994, Peter Shore developed his famous, uh, or discovered, depending on your philosophical position, uh, his, um, you know, Shore's algorithm that shows that you can do prime factorization exponentially faster than, than the classical methods. And that uh, effectively nullifies the one-way function uh, purpose of, of uh, you know, uh, multiplication and prime factorization. Therefore, you can basically destroy the, the, the cryptographic infrastructure of the internet. But then, you know, there are these issues of actually when we will have such a device that is capable of destroying the, the, the infrastructure and there are different uh, different opinions on it but if you if you look at these uh, risk maps you can see that the scales are from 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 years this of course doesn't mean that the risk is not real and there there's of course the migration period then you know the, it is a real thing but the, the narrative that we are trying to investigate here is that uh, how do we deal with this? So I will just digress a little bit here and talk about, you know, why do we need ethics? Do we need, you know, anything like responsible quantum technologies? Uh, if you have been following the quantum daily, they had a call to action for quantum ethics like two years ago. And there are many people like Elias Khan or uh, you know, people from many other uh, companies like Ilana Visby uh, calling for action. You know, we need to be more ethical, we need to be responsible. But do they mean the same thing? And what does responsible technology development even mean? And does it really make a difference? And uh, for that, I will talk a little bit about the concept of path dependencies, and I will give two examples from the field of quantum technologies. So the first thing is, what do we mean when we say, you know, responsibility or responsible technology development? So this is an example from our uh, PhD uh, module. So uh, hi to Marcel. I don't think he will watch this, but if he does, I just stole his slide. Uh, so when... Uh, there is a there is a new uh, technology usually sometimes like referred to as innovation, but when when it's a very highly technical or technological innovation, uh, there are of course potential benefits, but there are potential risks and potential damage that might uh, certain certain uh, stakeholders uh, you know experience. And if you're a technology enthusiast, your approach might be, you know, don't worry, be happy, the innovation must be pushed, possible damage will be managed later after we develop these things. And there are, of course, uh, even sometimes uh, people refer to as, oh, we need to lose some fingers uh, to, to have uh, new devices, you know, because they, you, will be exp you will be experimenting and, you know, they might blow uh, at your hand and you might lose some fingers, but that's okay for progress. On the other hand of the scale, there are, uh, you know, especially recent like environmentalists, they are more worried than happy. They think that innovations should only be introduced to the market if no potential damage is known, or at least we have an, a really strong management strategy to manage all the potential risks, which is a really, really constraining thing because we don't know anything about most of the potential uses of these technologies like we have some idea but if you go back to 1950s there is no way that people that are working on transistors could imagine facebook and should they even consider this as a potential risk because we don't know whether facebook or social media in general was a net positive or a net negative we have no idea even now and you know this uh, you know, risk mitigation kind of approaches uh, think that we should, you know, try to envisage the future and then we try to you know, just mitigate those risks. Uh, 
So when we say responsible technology development, we kind of mean something in the middle. So these uh, you know new technologies and innovation, they have sometimes huge potential benefits for a lot of uh, people and the different kind of stakeholders. They can elevate people from poverty. They can enable uh, people to be to do something that they couldn't have uh, be doing uh, otherwise. Uh, and for that sense, we should, as as humankind, of course, pursue uh, you know science, scientific development, and of course, technological development. But also, we need to identify and kind of uh, prepare ourselves for risks, you know. And when we say risk, people usually think that you know unintended consequences of technologies. But sometimes, even the intended consequences have certain risks. Let's say that you are building a coal power plant. Uh, if it works as intended, it will uh, emit carbon dioxide. This is not something at a, as an unintended consequence. It is an intended consequence, and we know that it will do that. So, uh, of course, if you are working on your responsibly on this topic, you might uh, try to consider, okay, how can we mitigate the potential damage that is caused by the intended uses of these technologies as well? Um, well, one example is seat belts. So uh, the the first uh, four wheeled pe petrol engine motor car uh, was uh, introduced to the to the highways uh, in 1894. So more than 100 or almost 130 years ago. Uh, but seat belts uh, only came into into law into force in UK. Uh, uh, on, in 1983 and even back then it was opposed by the conservative government and the labor official opposition so opposed by both parties and you know why because back even when you look at that almost 60 percent of the households had cars so more people had cars back then in UK than they had they didn't and there were many accidents and people were actually dying at that moment. But why were people against these seatbelts? Well, there's something called pet dependency. If you look at the, the size of the track gauges that we use in Europe uh, currently, they were actually designed for horse-drawn uh, wagons and carriages. And the road that they were using was actually designed in back in the Roman times. So the size of the tracks that we use right now are not optimized for trains or even just for cargo trains. They were optimized for the potential sizes that uh, the, the Romans were using and they were optimized because of the size of the horse's ass. So is it, uh, shouldn't we change these things? Apparently not, because we are still using them. And one other example is the the famous uh, you know uh, keyboard that we use Q W E R T Y, and for efficiency it is kind of terrible. We should be using, especially in English speaking languages or countries, we should be using this one instead of this one. But we don't. You know, even on our phones we are still using this one, or you know just slight variations of it depending on the language you use. So pet dependency is a rather strong force and after a certain locking point it becomes really really difficult to divert from this, this pet. Uh, and two examples from the quantum technologies field. One is the quantum energy initiative. So we all know that the, the devices we use, the computation devices like uh, like this uh, laptop that I'm right now communicating through to reach out to you or my phone, uh, they use transistors. And we also know that transistors or the design of the transistors uh, today, um, they're not very efficient. They are, they are actually really bad at energy efficiency. But we can change them because there is like trillions of euros of investment that went into making them on the nanoscale, like the, manuf like the manufacturing infrastructure, the wafers that we have. So all that investment and time and effort went into making them really, really good. But 
since the initial uh, technological path that they were being developed is not optimized to be energy efficient, even today, you know, these laptops get heated a lot, these phones require constant battery charges and they get heated up as well. And one initiative in the field of quantum technologies is the quantum energy initiative calling uh, for, you know, let's not repeat that mistake with quantum computers. And let's look at the energy based metrics for the, for the quantum technologies. And one point here is that when I'm sure you have heard that all oh, quantum computers will be much more energy efficient compared to their classical counterparts. Well, that might not be the case because when you add the quantum error correction codes, which actually run on high performance computing devices, which are classical devices, they might not be energy efficient after all. But the problem is we don't know. We don't know whether the qubits that we will use have, you know, 0.1 error rates or 0.001 or similar to transistors today, which is like 10 to the minus 13 error rates. Uh, and one other uh, project that I want to talk about here is the quantum ethics project. And this is of a different beast uh, because the, the idea here is for education. So now uh, around the world, there are many different uh, masters and PhD and even bachelor programs being developed to teach quantum technologies and uh, quantum information science. Uh, but we don't know how many of them contain, uh, you know, any course or any kind of seminar on general ethical problems or responsible technology development uh, for, for different kind of quantum technologies. There's probably, of course, you know, some uh, regular ethics course on you should not plagiarize or, you know, uh, general, uh, you know, publication related ethics or general academic ethics, but there are certain other uh, problems or, or potential dilemmas related to quantum technologies. Uh, but we, at least in, on students level, there is no course that are uh, focusing on this and quantum ethics project is one of the potential, uh, you know, remedies for that. Uh, and what I mean is when you look at the number of uh, master's program around the globe, you can see that even now there are more than 30 master's program around the globe and more are on their way because, for example, DGQ, you know, the Digitally Enhanced Quantum Technology Master Program under the, under the quantum flagship um, has more than 25 organizations, which are almost all universities uh, across 10 countries. So the number of potential master's programs or bachelor's programs will increase as well. And if we do not include anything on responsible technology development from the beginning, then it will become much harder in, in future times and much more costlier because it will be a path dependency. And to deviate from the path that you are on, it requires considerable uh, you know, social force like the seat belts that even after almost 100 years and hundreds of thousands of dead people still took a uh, rather uh, strong convincing to, to, you know, just get implemented. So what can we learn from these practical examples? One thing is what will be the energy consumption of future error corrected quantum computers and what do we know about them? Should we be worried or should we be relaxed because people are taking care of this. So what will be the uh, what will the future quantum engineers learn during their masters and PhD degrees? And when is the time to discuss this? What is the appropriate venue? Who gets to discuss and why? So these are just some questions that uh, we can think about. And returning back to the paper, uh, because I'm really looking forward to the discussion uh, session with you is so the three narratives again just to remind you is quantum technologies as an arena for geopolitics quantum mechanics as incomprehensible and quantum computing as a threat and we don't say that these narratives are just wrong there is of course truth in these things but overemphasizing these narratives create and or strengthen exclusionary practices and result in visionary lacking mechanisms 
often argued on the grounds of being fast and visions of the future and demands of certain stakeholders like security stakeholders are prioritized while the visions and demands from other stakeholders are suppressed and pet dependencies uh, and rush decisions have their associated costs too one example is this thing uh, maybe some of you remember this because a couple of years ago uh, you know UK decided to remove all the Huawei 5G towers and it was not because they believed 5G is causing COVID but because of the security threats but and this is expected to cost them like two billion pounds for almost nothing because they also still have to pay Huawei for all the towers that they bought from them. So this was kind of a rush decision because of some other expectations they have, like certain stakeholder groups, like the private actors were trying to earn some money and the national uh, security uh, stakeholders were probably not that involved in these decisions. But then the type changed and now they have to remove all these towers and replace them with other towers. So what we propose is, you know, accept that the world consists of more than just hegemonic powers and avoid protectionism or overprotectionism. Uh, having a focus on civilian uses related to sustainable developments instead of military uses. So these can be alternative narratives come against this, you know, quantum technologies is an arena for geopolitics. Uh, for the quantum mechanics is incomprehensible. I mean, famous code should only be used within its proper context and not to implicate that people cannot understand quantum mechanics because when you say this, it is it is wrong. There are people with hundreds of papers on quantum mechanics. People actually understand these things. We can build phones. We can build MRI devices. We can build lasers out of these things. So at least we have a certain understanding of how the quantum world works. So you can use it to, I don't know, install some, uh, you know, enchantment or you know mystery feeling but still you need to be sure that you are not uh, implicating that uh, only the experts can know and there is no way that people can learn about this thing and also quantum technology needs to become a normal or even mundane technology and pseudoscience should be criticized and finally the alternative narratives for quantum computing as a threat is you know, we need to focus on ways to constructively deal with these threats, like the NIST process. And there needs to be, uh, the, you know, realistic timelines needs to be presented. Not only the worst case scenarios like the Q days or the quantum apocalypse or, you know, stuff like that. Um, so some discussion and conclusion. We believe uh, that having a clear understanding of in which context the term democratization is located and used allows both developers, practitioners of policy actions like companies, public institutions, NGOs, a ground on which they can formulate their aims, goals, and visions. Uh, you know, phasing out some narratives and replacing them with more constructive ones that focus on solutions and realistic timelines and normalization of quantum mechanics and quantum technologies to be more inclusive. And just providing access to either the technology or the products of it is not necessarily uh, you know, democratization. It is a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. So because access does not guarantee agency. So there needs to be uh, more stakeholder engagement and empowerment. And some shameless self-advertisements the folks in Netherlands, they are doing some great work. I would strongly recommend you to check their websites of the Center for Quantum and Society and in general Quantum Delta Netherlands as well. And at, at ETAS at KIT in Castre, we have been organizing this series of responsible quantum technologies, which the, the third one just ended yesterday. Uh, and we will be organizing one on, uh, on next year as well. And also you can find the recordings of these uh, on our YouTube channel. So just feel free to go and watch them. And finally, I'd like to thank you for your attention and 
let's discuss. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Zaki, for this great presentation. Uh, all right, so it's now time for questions. Uh, I don't see questions on our chat, but maybe someone would like to unmute and ask a question. So maybe maybe uh, I can start. So Zeki, how, how do you think? What else? What else? Uh, as uh, the researchers, uh, enthusiasts, professionals working in the quantum industry, uh, what else we should do to ensure that? Uh, quantum technologies will be even more uh, democratized within the next, let's say, five, ten years. Or do you think that it's necessary to do more or much more? Um, or what what we are already doing is is sufficient? Well, that, that that's the that's the question, right? Because the first things first is. I think we need to identify or just make sure what we mean by democratization because I mean one of the things is uh, should companies necessarily be pushing for making this you know really democratized thing probably they won't be doing that because exclusivity ex actually is one of the things that they are pushing for in terms of patents the reason you get a patent for something is to obtain the exclusive commercial users use rights of that, that technology, right? So if you go to a company and say that you should just give this technology out for free, I mean, that, that doesn't, uh, it's not how, you know, capitalism works. Uh, and so what should we do? One thing is, of course, like inclusion, and I I don't mean this in the sense that you know ideological inclusion, but I mean that we need to reach out as researchers, as people that are involved in NGOs and people that are also sometimes involved in public decision making or at least advising public decision making. Uh, we 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 need to reach out to people uh, and uh, people in uh, different countries. Uh, people in uh, in different uh, socioeconomic status uh, in the countries, and again, I'm not saying that oh, you know, we should inc include everyone. Everybody should know how quantum computers work. I don't mean something like that. But at least there should be a way for people to get involved if they want to get involved. Uh, and for that, at least there needs to be the basics of some awareness. You know. For example, there exists something as something called a quantum computer, and it's not like sci-fi. It actually exists, uh, and of course, there are the issues of you know who will fund this, uh, to to which extent we need to do this, to you know bring people on board. Is it too early? So, you know, these are all very legitimate questions, uh, and you know, you I think. Uh, Personally and institutionally, we need to consider these when we are making such decisions. But I'm a, I'm a huge fan of you know outreach, so I think we should do more outreach. And along the way, uh, we should try to identify which kind of exclusionary uh, you know uh, practices, because all of us have exclusionary practices, which is a necessity because let's say that you're going to a university not everybody is going to, to the university right you certain people were excluded from going to that university but they shouldn't there should have been at least a chance for them to apply uh, so I don't know whether that makes sense but uh, mm -hmm. yeah okay, and there's, yeah. A, there, there's a question uh, I read and then there, yes. there's a hand so let me read yes. the question the question of ethics is quite complex. Do you think that democratization can really ensure universal ethical principles? I'm concerned that quantum technology may end up as nuclear technology with dual application. That's a good question, but again, one of the things is, is there or are there any universal ethical principles that are truly universal? We don't know mm -hmm. because, you know, I mean, ethics and moral virtues are two different things. And even in terms of moral virtues, I don't think we can agree on something universal. And for example, that is uh, that is why in the deliberative democratic approach, 
uh, you do not aim for you know universal principles or universal opinions because people can have different principles as their prior prior. I mean, even if they have the same principles, the prior, the rank ordering might be different. You know, people can care about certain principles more than others, and in terms of opinion, they can have conflicting opinion. But if you are going for democratization, especially in the deliberative context, people should agree on the judgment you know, what we should do with these things or what we shouldn't do with these things. Uh, you know, if you go and ask around on the world, I don't think anyone will say that we should include nuclear weapons into our, uh, you know, war making efforts. So I highly doubt that anyone is would advocate for using nuclear weapons. So this is something that as humanity, we decided together that we shouldn't do this. We didn't do it out of agreeing on ethical principles, but we agreed upon a judgment that we shouldn't use it. Uh, so maybe something similar can work for quantum technologies, but this is, you know, again, it, it depends on which kind of technology you are talking about. Quantum computing is something very different than quantum sensing, which is different than quantum communication. And even in quantum communication, there are different types of issues. You know, should everybody be able to access QKD networks? Because, mm -hmm. you know, pri yeah, privacy is a, is a principle that we care about, but also security is a principle that we care about and safety is a principle that we care about. And giving everyone complete privacy it may be counterproductive for certain safety measures. So we don't know, mm -hmm. you know, people, people can discuss this. And uh, the, the main call of the paper is that we need to involve as many different stakeholders as we can to discuss these things. Okay. I think there's a well, question from, from Anne. Yes, Anne, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. It was, it was excellent. And particularly the overview at the beginning. Thank you. It's, it's always good to get a, another example of how to sort of summarize this whole thing. Uh, my question is, is sort of, okay, um, as, you know, accepting your premises, um, I'm an average citizen. What is it that you want to raise in my awareness about quantum? Because again, you might start talking about, well, you know, the scientific or technical aspects of it. And I'm probably just going to, you know, zone out. It's like, I don't know how a car works. I just want to drive it. I don't know how, you know, the heating in my house works. I just want it to be cool when it's hot. Um, so what is it about, I mean, nuclear had such a visual aspect to it. You know, you saw gigantic, hideous mushroom clouds. Oh, that seems like something to be concerned about. How do you how do you engage me and leave me with something in my awareness that's different vis-a-vis -vis quantum? Thanks. Thank, thanks. Yeah, thanks. That's that's a very good question. So I think this is uh, one of the issues with outreach. Because I, so just to give you some uh, some background, we had this project. So it was a pilot project, and it, it wasn't funded, but uh, it ran for a year under the Quantum Technologies Education Group on the flagship, uh, the European uh, Quantum Technologies flagship, and uh, it was called Quantum Technologies Education for Everyone. But we also included outreach in in part of education. And one thing that we kind of uh, realized there is and also to discuss, uh, the, you know, it is really difficult to have one size fits all kind of an outreach or education approach, because in society, there are many different stakeholder groups. As you said, some people might really not be interested in what's going on, and they just want to be using the applications like, like the phone. I don't, know, yeah. I don't think a lot of people or a considerable majority of people, even in the people that are in the technical fields, know how their uh, smartphone works, you know, at least in every detail, but they still use it, they still benefit from it, sometimes they fear from it, uh, like the privacy concerns, uh, or, or, you know, uh, the addiction concerns, especially for social media. Uh, 
and having a digital literacy doesn't necessarily mean that you should go out and tell people how transistors work but at least they need to know that this is this is not magic uh, because there is this this uh, concept of a nature abhors vacuum and if you do not ex uh, explain something or at least an a proper scientific explanation of something doesn't exist out there and people know that they can access it then you get stuff like quantum healing quantum consciousness you know these different uh, you know quantum energy pendants that clean your you know aura or something so in in that sense what i would advocate for is not particularly reaching out to everyone but at least providing avenues that if someone wants to learn about these technologies in a little bit more detail they know where to look at or at least they know where to start from and then you just continue that thread to learn more about it for example if you want to learn more about how your car works i'm sure there are many youtube videos that you can learn from i, th I think you were going to say something so that i i stopped talking here Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I was listening to you. Um, and I don't I see other questions coming up. But 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 just to follow up what what again as average citizen, what I would be um, struggling to grasp here, you know, wanting in good faith to be an engaged citizen, informed citizen is what in what new how is quantum uh, going to evidence itself in my life. I mean, obviously cell phones evidence themselves mm. very tangibly. Cars evidence themselves very tangibly. Those are those are applications of underlying scientific principles, of course. But what technology do you see that I again could grasp as like, wow, that's something I should be looking for coming down the road. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And there is also one uh, line of thought in quantum ethics, uh, you know, thinking that uh, instead of focusing on technology, we should be focusing on the applications that people actually care about. Uh, and one, uh, you know, clear example that came out of that was the, the medical applications. You know, there is something called MEG. I, I will probably not pronounce it rather bad, but uh, like it is EEG, but for magnetic uh, fields like magnetoentocelography. Uh, and what it does is it, it, uh, yeah. so when you're using EEG, there are certain sensors that are, uh, you know, just sensing the electric field that is uh, caused by your brain or your by heart, you know, and if you use it for magnetic fields, uh, you can have much uh, higher resolution or uh, you, know, you can have uh, much more precise uh, you know, imaging outcomes. Uh, and I was at this NIH uh, workshop a couple of months ago, and I was really surprised to see that there are uh, a lot of companies working on making these MEGs uh, readily available. Uh, through using certain uh, quantum sensors like uh, optically pump magnetometers uh, and one practical uh, outcome of this might be uh, you know uh, to identify the early uh, arrhythmia in uh, babies uh, or unborn babies uh, hearts you know how their heart beats because right now apparently to identify it uh, they need to use uh, rather strong ultrasound techniques which is invasive, but if you use uh, MEGs, then you can actually uh, kind of uh, figure out when the baby's heart is pumping blood, and each time it you know contracts, it creates a certain disturbance in the magnetic field, and if you can you know really really uh, you, you can sense these really really small uh, vibrations or uh, disturbances in the magnetic field, you can identify the arrhythmia of uh, you know unborn babies. Uh, which is, I think, people would really care about. You know, uh, the similar things go for uh, goes for you know uh, certain types of uh, brain scan, brain scans, um, and you know those kind of medical applications. If people use uh, you know quantum inspired or you know quantum enhanced algorithms to uh, have your MRI, uh, even the same device, 
to, pro to uh, produce much more detailed images of your, uh, you know, uh, of your body, basically, of your, uh, you know, where the, where the tumor might be or where your, uh, you know, back might be in, in injured, then I think people will care uh, more. But again, to, to actually see those applications, uh, it is a little bit early, but it's not that early like you know these applications will enter people's lives much earlier than you know shores algorithm will be will be widely used for code breaking purposes awesome thank you very much thank you uh i think there are some questions in the chat yeah um, there are several questions um, i think so yeah, yeah so, I, I, for example, I think showing practical, useful business use versus fear mongering will go a long way to democratize of quantum computing and showing the good sides of it. Yeah, you know, if, if people can see that it is practically useful for them or at least accessible for them, like our phones again, uh, or our computers, which use certain types of uh, quantum technology, at least from the first quantum revolution, uh, then people will become uh, much more, uh, you know, maybe uh, you know, used to it. So it will be less mysterious, less magical. Uh, but that's that's exactly why we mean by, you know, we need to normalize these technologies. They need to become more of a normal thing. Uh, because then you can actually start, uh, you know, widely using them. It's a magical device cannot be widely used. People will because people will not understand it. And when we, when I say people will not understand, I don't necessarily mean that. Oh, there will be people with forks and torches that goes to you know burn the quantum computers, but it will be really difficult for a lot of purposes, like how to ensure certain things. Uh, that uh, occur on, uh, you know, certain algorithms that run on quantum computers or certain, uh, you know, medical devices that use quantum sensing. Because if you can't understand them, then it becomes rather difficult to normalize them and make them into, you know, risk assessment uh, schemes. And one question is, can you speak to the realness of quantum technologies and its impact on enabling overly positive or overly negative narratives? Could it be that we are just too early about a lot of this, but also cannot sit still for things to develop further? One example there is actually from the nanotechnologies field, because uh, I mean, the researchers here kind of remind me that usually uh, in the early days of nanotechnologies, there was, there was this heaven and hell kind of an approach, like, oh, everything will be solved. Nanotechnology will help us to solve everything very similar to some of the quantum narratives right now. And on the other hand, oh, there will be great goo and we will be dead because of nanotechnologies. So I, I think, yes, you are right. You know, as, as these technologies emerge in the early phases, people tend to think of heaven and hell, like the most positive and the most negative kind of approaches. And as things become more and more mundane, uh, you know, then people get used to it. And as you said, one of the one of the things that we can do is to push this narrative that okay, you will get used to it. It is not it is not something that nobody can understand. It is not that magical. It is just a new way of technologies that will be deployed in in generally in the society in the coming years. We are just in an early phase of it, so you don't need to fear about it. You don't need to be that excited about it. You know, you don't need to hype it. But you know, you just need to be aware of it. So there is there is a question by Afis. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Yes, thank you, Pro. Thank for you. The presentation. My question is that uh, since the beginning of the quantum computing, uh, quantum computing and its application. I observe that individual scientists can be working tirelessly to achieve one or more goals in the solving physical problem. My question goes like this. How will government be able to control the abuse of quantum computing technology among the individuals and the back to the government 
how will it be controlled in times of power shift? I think that's a good question. And uh, one issue there is we had this discussion like last year and people were advocating, okay, maybe we should have some additional uh, rules in how quantum computers, you know, cannot run Shor's algorithm and stuff like that. But one thing is, you know, just because you have means to commit crime doesn't mean that you should. And again, doesn't mean that there are not regulations against it. So let's say that someone uses a certain quantum computer to hack into other uh, people's private uh, data or private, uh, you know, information. It is still a crime, and it still falls under the the applications of the law enforcement. So what we need, probably need to do is to enforce the, these kind of law enforcement agencies in fighting against cybercrime, which will quantum computing, those kind of crimes that are committed by quantum computers will be. So just because you know you can run Shor's algorithm to you know, hack certain uh, certain uh, information, doesn't mean that you actually can, because you know you can get your knife and start killing people. But you are not doing that, and there, there are reasons that you are not doing that. And the reason is not that it is technically impossible or controlled by the government. You know, yeah, sometimes you know there are certain arms controls and stuff like that. Uh, but we shouldn't just uh, too fantasize this. In terms of governments, uh, yes. But then again, the question becomes: People are not using uh, at least uh, the states are not using nuclear weapons against each other uh, because we kind of agreed as the humankind that that is a very bad idea. Probably we need something like that for cyber warfare. I mean, because we need to identify that you know, or let's say in 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 war times, it is rather frowned upon to uh, you know bomb uh, hospitals because we we decided on that right because it's not that it is technically impossible you know people are not putting certain sensors on bombs so that they can't hit hospitals but we decided as as a society as a global society that that's a very bad thing uh, right now for cyberspace uh, such a such an agreement, such a deliberate uh, deliberated uh, position is not reached, and it, because it is rather new, right? The internet has been around for less than uh, at this, you know, a little bit around thirty years, at least for most of the most of the world. Um, so I agree that certain levels of control are necessary, but then. The, these control mechanisms shouldn't, or in certain cases, can't be uh, technological. They need to be ethical, and by by ethical, I don't mean that oh, we need to be you know nice people and stuff like that. But the ethics is also kind of a soft regulation. So initially, we need to start these ethical discussions. And as these dis discussions uh, mature, and a lot of people agree on certain uh, kind of uh, you know judgment uh, on on how to use these technologies and how not to use these technologies, then you know there can be regulatory efforts, uh, you know, just encoding uh, these into uh, you know regulation, law, uh, and actual uh, implementation and enforcement of those things. Uh, so yeah, but I mean, I'm much less concerned about individual uses for you know for bad purposes of quantum computers than uh, actual state level uses because individuals, if you do something like that, you are against the law enforcement because it is still technically a crime. Cyber warfare doesn't have that kind of uh, agreed upon uh, you know uh, you know gentleman's code, let's say, on it. The, does this answer your question? Perfect. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so there is a, so even today, it's hard to most of the people to understand classical computing. It will be possible to solve the understanding of quantum computing, even when classical computing is a black box to most of technology users. 
can we use black box mental models? We actually, this, this is a very good point. We discussed this yesterday in, in the event and, or maybe the day before, the, this metaphor of black box and black boxing. And again, uh, I think it comes down to, you know, yes, there is this black boxing method, but you know as a user that someone knows how to unpack this black box. Someone knows, and you can also learn how to, how a classical computer works. If you watch enough YouTube videos or enroll into a four-year, you know, uh, bachelor's degree program, in the end, you know that you will learn at least most of the most of the technical details. So you don't think that it's magic. You, it's just that it's it's a comp, it's a complicated technology or even a complex technology that you personally don't know how it operates. But you know that there are many many people that know how it operates. And if something breaks down, you can go to these people. They can open up your black box and then fix it for you. Um, so. One thing is that we need to accept quantum technologies is a technology like this. It is not magic. It is not something that is truly mystical and you know enigmatic or something. There are people that actually know how these things works. And also we need to lower the entry barrier uh, to learning how, how these things work. And for that, I mean, for example, in QWorld, we have multiple different uh, layers of, uh, of workshops. So you can start from QPrep, even if you don't know the basic linear algebra behind it. So you can learn QPrep, so you can uh, you know attend QPrep, learn about it, continue with QBronze, then Q, Q Nickel, Q Silver. You know, you can learn how it kind of operates. Uh, I'm not saying that everybody should learn about this, but these opportunities to learn uh, should be out there and accessible. So it's not that everybody needs to be an expert in something, but they should know that if they wanted to be, those opportunities are out there for them. So we, I, I kind of believe that this will uh, elevate a lot of the, you know, the access and, and, and knowledge kind of issues. Uh, so one question is, we cannot brush aside concerns but just stating only the positive sides or goodness of quantum technology without highlighting the potential risks. Uh, yeah, there, there's actually a really good paper uh, that analyzes the TEDx talks uh, uh, by, uh, by the Leiden group of Yudia Kramer. Uh, I would strongly recommend you, uh, you know, recommend it to you because uh, it apparently yeah, people usually focus on the positive sides and you know the the benefits uh, without uh, highlighting the potential risks. So that that is an issue. And again, the the responsible technology approach tries to balance those. So it's not like we shouldn't create hype. We shouldn't only talk about the positives and the and the, and the opportunities and the potentialities, but also we shouldn't focus really only or really strongly on the risks and potential damage because by doing that again it creates an exclusionary uh, environment we are excluding the people that we assume or the stakeholders that we assume that might cause harm so you know just focusing on risks and focusing on benefits are both kind of have their own exclusionary uh, mindsets. Mm -hmm. I'm reading the chat, but Mpala, you are you are going to say something, right? Um, no, so in, in fact, we have several comments uh, here. Um, so there are other comments than, than questions. Uh, there is maybe one comment about legal and political changes quantum computing implies, but it's a question from Itamar. Uh, but it's it's uh, up to you, Zeki, in fact, if you, uh, or which questions you would like to answer or to which no, comments I mean, I'm, you would I'm, like I'm, to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading, but I, I think this this there's just a healthy discussion going on in the chat, which yeah. is nice, you know, just seeing that 
Yeah, I agree. We, we shouldn't overhype the technology. We shouldn't focus too much on the negative or negatively hype, like this heaven and hell kind of approach. You know, hell is also a hype thing. You know, you're hyping the potential damage or heaven is also a hype thing because, you know, again, in the end, this will, this technology will hopefully be something in the, in the middle that is rather mundane and earthly. Uh, and for in terms of you know political changes that quantum computing or quantum technologies in general might imply, um, I think we need to consider this in a more uh, general context. Like uh, there are many, uh, the, the the world is going through a kind of a change, let's say, and quantum technologies is just uh, it's getting affected by it. But uh, I don't think it is necessarily the only thing that is getting affected by it. So I'm, I think that's a good point. You know, there needs to be more focus on the geopolitics of uh, these technologies. But the focus on geopolitics shouldn't be um, done in a way to exclude, uh, you know, certain stakeholders from discussing uh, the effects because I mean when I say you know we shouldn't exclude uh, certain groups I'm not just saying this because you know we should be inclusive in all sense but if you only allow certain stakeholders to promote their uh, opinions and ideas and you know uh, just call for their judgments then uh, you you have it is a it may lead to pitfalls. You might be you might be uh, missing out certain legitimate criticisms against those judgments and those opinions, and that might lead to really suboptimal outcomes compared to a more you know deliberative uh, discussion. And of course, I know that having these deliberative discussions or let's say these democratic venues takes time. It is usually a very um, frustrating experience to, you know, butt hats with people, constantly discuss, and people coming up with counter arguments against your arguments, and people having conflicting opinions and conflicting ethical principles, maybe, against yours. Uh, but then it has utility and that's why we have you know these democratic processes in most of the world because otherwise if things speak if things start going down there is nothing to stop them from you know going further down uh, so one question is in regular quantum com in regular computing we see a lot of really good tools to develop software what is the progress of tooling in the quantum landscape looking like making those tools available to everyone? Uh, I would really, really strongly recommend Unitary Fund uh, and the, the, the projects of Unitary Fund uh, for that because Unitary Fund is, uh, is an NGO. They have been supporting uh, you know, these open source projects and they are also running uh, some open source projects. One of them is Mythic uh, on air mitigation. Uh, and one of them is metric uh, on you know uh, benchmarking uh, certain certain quantum processors. Um, so in that sense, yeah, I think uh, especially also Qiskit uh, is open source and it has been working wonders for for the community. Like I recently I heard that they have more than five hundred thousand registered users. So half a million people are registered to Qiskit. Just saying that it's just think about 2016. If somebody said to you in seven years we will have half a million people in a quantum software or quantum uh, so quantum software language platform, we wouldn't believe it. I would let me let me just rephrase phrase it like that. You know, we we would say that oh yeah, you know, you're over optimistic. But now it has so. I think they are doing great, the IBM folks. They have been uh, strong proponents of democratization of these technologies. And they were actually, in the, in the paper, we go through some of IBM's efforts. But again, I think the, the question comes to in which value context they are doing this. And oh, I think it's a mix of both. You know, There are certain people 
uh, that are truly doing this for democratization sake, but they're also a for-profit company. So they also need to do it in an instrumental setting. So at the moment that pushing for further democratization is counterproductive to their for-profit motives, as a company, they shouldn't do it. But there needs to be others like public actors or NGOs that can take over those efforts and continue. So we shouldn't only rely on, uh, you know, the a group of people in a company that are pushing for these kind of things. There needs to be some other uh, groups uh, or that can take over these efforts. No, I, yeah, so I, I also read what Sunil is saying that, you know, uh, 1 million plus users in a month is much more than 500,000 developers in six years. But then again, the question is 500,000 people are not users. They are supposed to be developers compared to, you know, ChatGPT, which people are users of ChatGPT, but they are not developing ChatGPT. Um, yeah, so, you know, slow shows that tech adoption is slower than social media adoption because of the low rate barrier to entry. And also one question is, how many quantum software developers do we actually need? Because, you know, I think that is something we need to discuss as well. Having people learn about these things, it is great. But the actual number of people that, at least in the current state of the hardware, that we need for people to write code and develop these things, uh, it's not, you know, 500,000. So I think the, you know, the, the rate of adoption should also follow the rate of actual demand. And in that sense, we are somehow falling short, but only, only somehow. I think there's a question by Itamar. Yes, go on, Itamar. Uh, you are muted now. Yeah, you might be muted if you are if you are speaking. Uh, okay, do you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, I want to continue my question in the chat that was touched upon many people before and your very eloquent answers and philosophy, aside of your technical expertise, you, you gave us beautiful philosophy and trade-offs and considerations. But my question is geared to another direction. The global responsibility implies that new technology as powerful as quantum computing may imply legislation changes, major ones, and also influence on the politics of the world because competition and collaboration are now taking a different flavor or different sense because the problems of quantum computing, the technical ones, number of qubits and stability and all that, are not for one player to do or one player to aim to dominate the world of quantum computing. The collaboration is shown in many, many instances. And so maybe the ethics issues may be solved or dealt with by changing some laws, some rules of society. And the politics of competing or country against country or uh, underworld against the banks need to be changed by some new laws. I wonder what you think about that. Yeah, thanks. I mean, uh, again, this is being discussed and 
I think it's an important point to discuss. So I might uh, guide you towards uh, the works of Joris von Hoboken at University of Amsterdam. So they are focusing on the, the legal aspects of uh, quantum technologies, primarily quantum computing. And there are some, uh, I mean, several PhD uh, students and even you know, there was a PhD thesis on uh, how to connect um, basically human values in a legal context, uh, like access to science, uh, compared to how quantum computing is being developed. And one other person I might uh, recommend you is Amnon Rechman uh, from Haifa. Uh, and one other might be Matthias Ketterman uh, from uh, Austria, uh, Innsbruck. So they, he's, he's the lead of uh, Institute for uh, Innsbruck Quantum Ethics Lab. Uh, and he, he usually uses this ethics as a soft regulation kind of a mindset. So initially we need to explore the ethical landscape to actually come to what can be legislatively you know implementable because uh, you know initially when you say when somebody comes and says that okay uh, you know no quantum computer should ever be able to run Shor's algorithm but technically is it even possible you know you can because Shor's algorithm is not just Shor's algorithm it's a, it's a class of problems and you can transform a certain other problems to de facto behave like Shor's algorithm and you know it becomes a kind of a complicated issue and even you know any law or regulation can you know easily easily solve you know you can't just say that you know you shouldn't be bad people because bad people don't really care about whether you know you say that or not um and also there was recently a talk i, I think we would upload this online as well by, uh, by Basil Maynard from uh, uh berlin uh tu berlin um Austria Institute of Technology and he he also kind of mentioned that this bad actor narrative is kind of pushing a responsibility to you know who might be doing bad things with these kind of technologies but we need to consider this responsibility uh, framework in a more general sense like developers are also responsible companies are also responsible governments are also responsible uh, so in that sense, if you are saying that we should have a global, uh, you know, approach to this, I think everybody agrees. But then we don't really have a globalized, or let's say in a couple of years, the expectation is that we don't really have a globalized world in terms of legislative schemes. So it is it's rather difficult. Uh, but there are there are efforts like from from uh, JESTA. There is this thing called Open Quantum Institute, uh, from World Economic Forum. There are these governance principles. So there there are such uh, such proposals, uh, and we will we will see whether they will they will succeed or not. Thank you so much, and I wonder if you could put the names of these organizations and the names of scholars that you mentioned either on the chat or on your own website or both? Let me put this one and this, right, this one. I heard about 20 names, so <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, the list will I'm, be very useful. Uh, I'm putting, I'm putting some of them, the ones that I can, you know. Yeah, this one. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think these are these are the main ones that I mentioned. Uh, okay. Yeah, pe I mean, people are thinking about this, and I think that is a very timely, timely discussion because we need to be thinking about this. And uh, as I said, we are 
kind of early, but we don't really know how early we are, so we shouldn't be too complicit in you know, just, oh, we are too early, we don't need to think about these things. Uh, but also, as previously discussed, there are not you know, widespread applications like ChatGPT out there. Uh, so I would say we are much earlier than AI, at least in that sense, because ChatGPT is already out there. People are already using it, and you know, the, the AI legislations are just coming in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Maybe, maybe regarding uh, the Shores algorithm, I believe that some people might be already aware of that, but there are also uh, ongoing research works already started many years ago uh, on uh, post-quantum algorithms, post-quantum cryptography algorithms that could be, let's say, quantum safe and uh, resistant to attacks, at least using Shor's algorithm and, and Grover's algorithm. Yeah, exactly. So that in, in the paper that one of the counter narratives we kind of propose is that of course, we should accept that the threat is real, but we should also acknowledge that there are, you know, brilliant people and considerable resources being uh, committed into, you know, just mitigating that threat. I mean, the NIST process has been going on since 2016, and we kind of know that NSA has been aware of this problem and pushing for a policy change since 2013. So. It has been around. People have been discussing this for almost the last 10 years, and there are some practical uh, solutions already proposed. And, you know, at, at least in Germany and US, and I, as far as I know in UK, there are already migration, uh, uh, you know, timelines uh, settled for post quantum cryptography. Of course, we don't know, I mean, at least 100% know that these will be. The definitively the end for the quantum threat. But at least people are caring about it and they are trying to do something. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's see some further comments. Uh, yeah, so for example, again, similar question is possible to create an independent international organization yeah. to protect the general public. Again, as I said, there are those kind of organizations and to, I mean, it is discussable whether we need a quantum specific one, because it, again, as I said, it is, it is a crime to hack into people's emails and, you know, just, uh, at least for individuals, for states, it's a little bit different. That's why I'm saying that, you know, I think we need a more general, uh, you know, kind of cyber warfare or a cyber, uh, you know, cyberspace kind of a uh, kind of an agreement. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have more questions? There's a question from Sonia. Should philosophers also be involved in the discussion about ethics? They are, they uh -huh. are. I mean, if, if you look at what's going on in the Netherlands, like Peter Famas, in France, Alexei Grimbaum, uh, I, I it, even like in IBM, uh, the responsible quantum computing unit, uh, Mira Wolf above, and she's technically a philosopher. So uh, mm -hmm. there are people involved, there are philosophers involved in these discussions. But again, there needs to be a collaboration between philosophers, you know, ethicists, uh, you know, responsibility officers, and people that actually know what is technically possible and what is technically not, because it is really difficult for a lawyer or a philosopher or an ethicist to kind of have a true grasp on what mm -hmm. these technologies can be used for. Because mm -hmm. let's admit, it is sometimes really difficult for a physicist or a computer scientist to have a true grasp on what these technologies can be used for. So mm -hmm. yeah, we, we need to collaborate more and involve people. As I said, be inclusive as possible. All right. Uh, do we have more questions? Uh, Itamar, your hand is still raised. I'm not sure if you would like to ask one more question or uh, is it still after the first one? Uh, no. So there's some question from Itamar. Uh, 
There is a comment from Anna about quantum computing at the blockchain center. Okay. Um, all right. I think I don't see more questions. There are some comments and thanks, of course, on our chat. Uh, your last chance for uh, to ask a question. So I can uh, repost the links because apparently mm -hmm. some people didn't get it. Um, yeah, I'm reposting all of them in a single uh, so that people can copy paste it. I think people can copy paste it, right? Because sometimes yes. Zoom doesn't allow that. Or... I think it should be allowed. Uh, in the Zoom. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Zaki, for this. All right. Uh, I don't see more questions now, so I think we can conclude and, and finish. So, Zaki, thank you once again for, first of all, a great presentation and uh, very interesting and fruitful discussion. So, we had many questions, and I believe we learned a lot. So, thanks for that. And we'd also like to thank all the participants. Uh, for attending and also asking um, all these interesting questions and uh, being involved in uh, in the discussions. So yeah, there are very there's a very positive feedback on our chat. So I believe that we all learned a lot and are satisfied. Uh, so with this, I think we can finish, and we hope to see all of you on our next uh, meetups. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Pavel, and thanks for the great moderation. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.